1031 WRNR. Good morning, I'm Alex Courtright. It's now the early 18th century. European powers are busy building empires, fighting over remote islands and territories in the New World, claiming prizes as fast as their ships would permit, and piracy is exploding. This is the era of Blackbeard and Calico Jack, Anne Bonny and Mary Reed. David Cordingly is an English naval historian and one of the world's preeminent authorities on pirates. His new book, Pirate Hunter of the Caribbean, The Adventurous Life of Captain Woods Rogers, is now available in paperback. And given that today is Talk Like a Pirate Day, I thought it would be fun to learn about real pirates. Good morning, David. Good morning. So, in this period, the late 17th, early 18th centuries, how would pirates of the Caribbean actually have spoken? Well, we, we don't know. Um, all one can t- Because the trouble is, the pirates left no diaries or journals, so we only have accounts from people who were captured by pirates, by sailors and sea captains, and also by uh, accounts of pirate trials. And they simply come across like everybody else in the population. I mean, they're mostly... Uh, sort of what you would call working class people. Most of them were former sailors, but we don't really know how people, uh, you know, the sort of accents or anything people had in those days. Right, so the whole arg matey is uh, probably a fiction created by Hollywood. Well, and mostly by Robert Newton in the film Treasure Island. Yes, he, he sort of, he really got the ha-ha gym lad thing going. Right, right. Now, as we know, life 300 years ago was difficult for most people, but how about life aboard a pirate ship in this period? Well, a pirate ship actually had life a lot easier than an average merchant ship, and uh, merchant ships were worked hard by the ship owners, and they had very small crews, and they covered huge distances, often going from Europe to the West Indies and to Boston and Charleston, South Carolina and things, and people, the crew had to work very hard, and were often quite badly treated. And one of the reasons that people took up piracy was uh, you mutinied, you captured a ship, and life was a lot easier. You could uh, decide where you went to go, and and pirates ran a sort of democratic regime on their ships universally, whereby they voted the captain in and out of office, decided where they were going, and that sort of thing. And what they would do is they would lurk around some Caribbean island, capture a small merchant ship, get thoroughly boozed up on on rum or whatever was on board, um, and then sail to the nearest port and just have a good time with wine, women, and song. And the impression one gets with pirates is that they spent an awful lot of time just sitting around in ships and beaches and getting drunk. And uh, there were, of course, moments of high drama when sometimes they were attacked by a naval ship and had to put up a fight. But on the whole, they chose their victims fairly carefully and you know, in a place like the Caribbean, where the islands are very far apart and there's no radio in those days, um, they were unlikely to get caught. Hmm. Interesting. We're speaking this morning to David Cordingly, his new book, Pirate Hunter of the Caribbean, The Adventurous Life of Captain Woods Rogers. Now, Woods Rogers, an interesting figure of this era, he hunted pirates, but like the old adage goes, it takes one to know one. Woods himself was a, a pirate of sorts, really a privateer. Yes, he was. He, he was set off from Bristol uh, in around 1701, 2 out to the Pacific to capture Spanish ships, Spanish treasure ships. And in fact, after a lot of adventures during which he actually rescued Alexander Selkirk, who was the forerunner of, of Robinson Crusoe from an island in the Pacific, he then captured what was called the Manila Galleon, which was a fabulous treasure ship just off the coast of California. And he sailed that back to Britain. Uh, it had about um, eleven million dollars worth of goods on board. Mm. Uh, so he, you know, he'd made his mark as a privateer. And then what happened was there was a tremendous outburst of piracy based on Nassau in the Bahamas for all sorts of reasons. And that became Pirate Centre. And the British government decided they had to do something about it because colonial governors in Jamaica and elsewhere were complaining that all their local ships were getting attacked. And they decided that Captain Woods Rogers, who was a a really tough character, was the one to send and deal with the problem. So they made him governor of the Bahamas and sent him off in a small ship uh, with a naval escort off to Nassau in the Bahamas, where he uh, promptly sorted out the pirates.
You make the point that there was um, a bit of an explosion in piracy shortly after the signing of the Treaty of Utrecht in 1713, which did a lot of things, but it did end the War of Spanish Succession, and with it, many of the hostilities between some of the major European powers. So what you have is these privateers like Woods Rogers and many others, and sailors who no longer have a job. So what do they do? Some of them become pirates. Well, that is exactly it. The, the Treaty of Utrecht certainly, as you say, brought peace to uh, a, a large part of the Western world, but it threw literally thousands of sailors out of work because the, the, the British Navy simply cut down drastically on the number of naval seamen they needed. So you've got the seaports um, on both sides of the Atlantic filled with out-of-work, uh, redundant sailors. And, of course, the one thing a sailor can do is, is uh, work a ship, sail a ship, and a lot of them simply grabbed hold of a ship from you know one means or another and took to the high seas and took to piracy. And... Uh, you know, in a way, you can't blame them. If you're out of work and you have one skill, you might as well make use of it. And um, among the pirates, you get these extraordinary characters uh, developing, like like Blackbeard and Calico Jack and, and the female pirates, appearing from Nassau and the Bahamas and, and going out and, and attacking um, East Coast of America in particular. And some of them got as far as Africa and, and started to rampage along the coast of Africa. So they were quite adventurous because... Of course, they knew how to sail, and they were good at navigation, and they were a very tough lot. You mentioned Blackbeard by name. I find him to be particularly interesting. He he had a unique style, to say the least, and, and he actually wound up in Ocracroke off the coast of North Carolina, where many people from this part of the country actually will uh, take their summer vacations. Tell us a little bit more about Blackbeard. Well, Blackbeard is a curious character because well, he came from Bristol originally, um, he took to piracy in the Bahamas, and he made a speciality of looking terrifying. He was, we know from accounts of people who came across him, and particularly the lieutenant who actually brought him to book, that he was well over six foot. He had an enormous black beard that he used to plait, and he would go into battle with matches, those are the things that you lighted a, a gun with, a flaming under his hat. <laughs> and so he deliberately had this terrifying image in order to persuade anyone who saw him coming to, to surrender without a fight. And he'd attacked a number of seaports along the eastern seaboard of the United States, um, and um, the governor of Massachusetts decided that he must do something about it and um, sent off two naval ships to deal with him. And somebody called Lieutenant Maynard tracked Blackbeard down to Ocracoke Inlet, and at dawn one day, uh, he crept up on Blackbeard, who was getting fairly drunk with the rest of his crew, and fired a gun at him, and Blackbeard fired back. And uh, the most extraordinary thing was, and it's well documented, uh, there was a, a massive duel on board Blackbeard's ship between Lieutenant Maynard and Blackbeard, and Blackbeard eventually fell to the deck with several musket shots in him and several cutlass wounds. And he was actually finished off by a Highlander who came up behind him and with a claymore and simply cut off his head. And they threw his body in the, in the water and uh, reputedly it then swam headless three times around the ship. <laughs> but uh, the, the, uh, you can believe that if you want. Yeah. But the rest of his crew were rounded up and were taken off to Williamsburg and they were found guilty of piracy and, and hanged from a tree uh, outside Williams, Colonial William, Williamsburg. Mm, interesting. This morning on the phone with David Cordingly, he is in Great Britain. He is a British naval historian and one of the leading authorities on pirates. His latest book is now available in trade paperback. It's called Pirate Hunter of the Caribbean, The Adventurous Life of Captain Woods Rogers. David, I wanted to bring you back for a moment to Daniel Defoe and his most famous book, Robinson Crusoe, a great adventure Indeed, story yeah. that so many of us have read. And you make the point in your book that, really, Daniel Defoe may never have been able to write this book had it not been for Woods Rogers and the account he shared of the story of Alexander Selkirk. Well, that's exactly it. It is. Um, I think Woods Rogers deserves more fame than he gets, simply for that reason. He, was, he rounded Cape Horn and made for the island of Juan Fernandez, which is a more or less level with Valparaiso in, in Chile, mm. uh, which was a famous a sort of refuge for seafarers who'd rounded the Cape Horn and also for pirates and buccaneers. And he arrived at the island and put a boat ashore, and they'd seen a fire burning on the shore, 
and they were met by this man who could hardly speak because he hadn't spoken to anyone for four years and four months, who was a former Scottish sailor who'd been marooned on the island by a previous sea captain and who was delighted, obviously, to see his fellow countrymen arrive to rescue him. And he'd been living all on his own on the island, living off goats and turnips uh, left by previous uh, visitors to the island and fish and, and things like that. Survived quite well. He was quite healthy when they met him. And Woods Rogers took him on board his ship and made him a, a mate of his ship because he was an experienced seafarer and took him back to England. And Woods Rogers then wrote a book about his adventures, capturing the galleon and rescuing Alexander Selkirk. Wrote a book called A Cruising Voyage Around the World. And it was his account, a very detailed account, of exactly how Selkirk had survived and what he'd lived on and how he'd used goat skins to make himself clothes and that sort of thing, Mm. that undoubtedly provided Daniel Defoe, who was in London as a journalist around that time, with the raw material for Robinson Crusoe. So, you know, that provided him with a lot of the information that he needed to to build up his book, a book which, as you say, has become one of the great classics of literature. Mm, interesting stuff. Pirates, of course, still exist. And no, of course, I'm not talking about the baseball team from Pittsburgh either. Pirates in uh, the South China Sea, in Bangladesh, Indonesia, and perhaps most famously of all, off of the coast of Somalia. Now, David, knowing what you do of piracy's history, how have yeah. things changed or not? Well, they've changed in many ways, obviously, because the, the methods used by the, the Somali pirates in particular are rather different. They They make use of uh, modern navigational aids like GPS to navigate the seas. They use, obviously, different weapons, automatic uh, uh, weapons and uh, things like that. And what they have done increasingly is to operate from what are called motherships far out in the Indian Ocean, which gives them a tremendous scope for intercepting ships coming down the Red Sea and round the coast of Africa. And their principle, the basis of what they do, is rather different from the pirates of the West Indies who simply ransacked a ship for anything valuable they could find. What the Somali pirates in particular have done very successfully is to capture a, a large, a very large ship and then hold the crew to ransom and demand a ransom of millions of pounds. And on the whole, they've been highly successful. They've, they've succeeded in extracting not as much money as they would like from the various ship owners and shipping companies, but several million pounds from each one of them, which has built up a tremendous reserve of capital so they've been able to improve their ships and their methods and their weapons. And really until about a year ago when the authorities in that region really started having a go at them and and retaliating, they were, you know, having a field day and, and one could see no end to it. But there has now been a concerted international effort to intercept the pirates and there have been a number of spectacular raids on pirates when they've captured the ship. And the number of pirate attacks has started for the first time to fall away. But um, they have been a, a very serious menace in that part of the world. We're speaking this morning to David Cordingly, an author And his new book is called Pirate Hunter of the Caribbean, The Adventurous Life of Captain Woods Rogers. David, thank you so much for talking with us today. It's been a pleasure.